Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. It is a pleasure to greet you today. Thank you for choosing to worship here. We are honored about that and so glad that you're here. We would love to know that you've been here today. And so nearby, you should see some attendance cards. And if you would fill one of those out during the service, then when we have our offering later on, in addition to your tithe or offering, we invite you to put that card in the plate as well. We want to know that you're here, and we want to know if there are specific ways that we can serve you. And if today's the day that if you've been visiting with us, and if today's the day that you would like to become a member of the congregation also near you, you'll find a card called How to Join. And if you would fill that out, we will give you an invitation at the end of the service. Where all of us are greeting you this morning on behalf of Dr. Tim Brewster, our senior pastor, who has been away this week with one of our important denominational groups. Um, And so he has been a very busy guy, and I know that he is thinking about you this morning, and I know that he's very pleased that Reverend Case... Wait a minute! (laughs) Who allowed that man in here? Well, doggone it, Tim, it's great to see you. So when Casey preaches this morning, you can say, yes, I knew she would do a great job. Well, if you would, please say good morning to Tim later on today, if you're able to. Well, this is perfect, because for Tim and for all of you, there are three opportunities this morning. I've learned a lot of things from Mark Burroughs, and here is one of them. If you would, repeat after me. Number one. The first thing today is obvious. Outside, there is an explosion of celebration for our camping ministries. If you've come across Fifth Street, you've seen campers and tents, there's food, there's great people. As you leave today, please go outside. I believe they're hot dogs. I think they're sweet things. Uh, And there are great people that will give you information and invite you to be part of this ministry. They have an incredible time, and they want you to know that you are welcome. Number two, two. this week, if you go to our website, you will notice that this week on Wednesday at 1130, there'll be an important meeting for a new group in our church, a two-year study on the nature of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. This is going to be something that will become an important focus in our church. And just the fact that it became quiet right then is a reminder to us that this is really important. It touches all of us. And so beginning this week at 1130 on Wednesday, if you can join us, we invite you to do that. And we encourage you to look for the upcoming opportunities for us to learn more and for us to make this an important ministry. Number three, it's time for the singing men of First United Methodist Church. Robert, don't we need to have men sing? That's his yes. That is such a big yes. The singing men of Fort Worth will be singing on Mother's Day. And so we want to invite all of you male-looking guys to join us this Wednesday at 8 p.m., one hour from 8 to 9, and then next Wednesday from 8 to 9, we will be rehearsing as a group, and then we will be singing in the sanctuary services on Mother's Day. Please come and be a part of it. It is such a good time, and the music is extraordinary. So thank you for that. And again, thank you for being here today. And now through the leadership of our choir, let us prepare. Dr. Smith, how are you this morning? Number four. That's right. Oh. Bishop Ben Chamness and his wife Joy, I think they're right over there. Would you wave a little higher so we can say good morning to you and welcome? If you didn't hear this part, you need to hear it. Lamar said that Bishop Chamness and Joy 
had the good sense to come west to Tarrant County and not worship in that eastern area. <laughs> Lamar is oh so right. And now let us prepare ourselves for worship. Would you please stand for the call to worship? I love the Lord because God hears my supplications. The Lord is gracious. It is God who makes things right. God takes the side of the helpless and protects the simple. I invite you now to turn back to the bulletin so that we can affirm our faith together. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, 
whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should help us itself in service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Please be seated. The sacrament of baptism is a holy and sacred time in the life of the church and a very special time in the life of a family. This morning, I would invite the Cantrell family forward to bring their son or their daughter, I'm sorry, for infant baptism. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, baptism is a sacrament. It is a means of grace indicating that we do not come into this relationship on the basis of anything that we have done or anything that we have accomplished, but simply on the basis of God's gracious invitation of love to us. Infant baptism is an especially appropriate demonstration of this grace as we remember the words of Jesus when he said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. Blair and Colt, I ask you on behalf of the church, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your own teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Yes. As her parents, it is your privilege to name this child. What name do you give her? Blythe Hanley. Blythe Hanley. Blythe Hanley, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now if you'll put your hands on her. Blythe Hanley, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you may become a faithful <laughs> disciple of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And she is excited about this profession of faith, isn't she? Yes, you are, and my necklace turn you around so you can see your new church family and she will be looking to you just as she looks to her parents to be a teaching example by the way you live your own lives that you live out your own faith 
And uh, that's how she will learn what it means to be a Christian until she can make this confession of faith on her own at this or some other congregation. And she'll just remain this enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah. Would you, eat with equal enthusiasm, join me in the congregational response that's printed in your bulletin. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Blythe Hanley, surrounded by steadfast love, may be Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. And while they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem that is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last three days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the prophets as prophet. But our chief priest and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. What he had hoped, we had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there is more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning, didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the woman said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all the prophets have talked about. Wasn't it necessary for Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going ahead, but they urged him saying, oh, stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened. They recognized him, but he disappeared right from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road? And when he explained the scriptures for us, then they got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them 
as he broke the bread. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God. may be seated. Well, <clears throat> the admittedly very long scripture reading for today, uh, which Gay read perfectly, perfectly. Mike uh, just said a minute ago that um, we're all better preachers when Gay Fuller reads the scripture for us, and it's true. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for that. This text, this long text, this beautiful narrative begins with the words, on that same day. On that same day. The same day they are talking about is the one that we know as the third day. The same day that the women went to the tomb, the same day that those same women found the stone rolled away that had once closed Jesus' tomb just three days before, The same day that those curious women went boldly into the tomb to find that Jesus' body really wasn't there. The same day they learned that he had been raised. The same day that those women excitedly returned and reported the great news of his resurrection to the apostles. The same day that those devastated apostles thought this report was nonsense the same day that Peter ran to the tomb wanting to understand what they might be talking about, and the same day that Peter saw the very same thing for himself. On that same day, on that same first Easter day, we meet two disciples. One named Cleopas, and another whose name we don't know, but who was likely among the extended group of Jesus' followers— They have left Jerusalem at this point and are traveling together to Emmaus, a seven-mile journey, it tells us, and they are likely returning home after having traveled to Jerusalem for Passover, maybe already thinking about what they're going to do with their lives now that the whole Jesus experiment is over. They were talking to each other discussing everything that had just happened over the last few days, including the reports of those women and Peter. We don't know much of anything about this conversation they were having on that road, but we have imaginations and we have empathy. So, knowing nothing of their relationship with each other, I have to imagine 
that they were sharing grief and reviewing details of these days. Frustrated, sad, disappointed and lost, lonely, afraid and angry, maybe ashamed, heartbroken and filled with doubt. They had bet their lives on the wrong savior. Two days ago, the one that they had been following had been brutally beaten and murdered publicly. Horrific sounds and images are lodged in their brains. While not much is said about this conversation, one biblical commentator speaks of the probable intensity between these two. It seems that the narrator uses three different Greek terms to describe the conversation in those first two verses. And I am not going to teach you Greek today. I just want to teach you about the meanings of those three words. In those first two verses, three different words used to describe this conversation. One, that implies an intense discussion. One, meaning emotional dialogue. And one that meant debate or examining evidence together. So why does that even matter, preacher? Because their conversation may have just been a little bit hotter than we assume when we first read it. Their discussion, their emotional dialogue, their debate may have resembled the conversations that we have found ourselves in recently. You know the ones, the ones that happen in person, the ones we boldly enter into on social media, and even the ones that we play out in our minds. Had they lost sight of each other as we have? Had their frustration and sadness and disappointment spiraled down into an argument? Out of their own deep pain, had the tension within these two boiled over into terseness between them? Had two men literally traveling on the same road to the same hometown, sharing a common suffering, found a way to combat with one another? We can imagine that it is possible because we've been there, we might even be there right now. I recently read, and I'm currently rereading a book that if you've talked to me really at all recently, I've probably told you about. Um, it's a book by the Arbinger Institute called The Anatomy of Peace, and the subtitle is Resolving the Heart of Conflict. And it draws uh, almost painful attention to a reality that we all know inherently. And this is it. Each of us in any moment is operating from one of two ways of being toward others. We are operating with a heart at peace, that's one, and with a heart at peace we see others as people. We see others as people with hopes and needs and cares and fears that are as real to me as my own. That's a heart at peace. Or, alternatively, we are toward each other with a heart at war. With a heart at war, I'm seeing other people as objects, meaning that when I see someone, I view him or her as an obstacle to be dealt with. I see him or her as a vehicle to get what I want, or maybe even an altogether irrelevancy. That brief description of a heart at war is all that we need to recognize that we are currently operating with one toward people in our own lives. Our heart is at war when we decide that someone is on the other side of an issue from us. We take a side and we stand firmly on it. We nobly join a camp. We finally find our tribe. We hunker down with those with whom we are of one mind. And from our side, from our camp, from our tribe, from our gathering of the like-minded, we look at those on the other side, in the other camp, in an altogether different tribe and of another mind, and we make decisions about who they are all together. And with our assumptions in tow, we embark on conversation with an Emmaus tone. We have intense discussions over rapidly performed executions in Arkansas, about gun control and about Second Amendment rights. 
We have emotional dialogue, deeply emotional dialogue about climate change, about sexism, about healthcare, and about immigration. We debate black lives. We debate police. We debate people's very lives. We find our own denomination again in the national spotlight over our long and gut-wrenching debate about the inclusion of LGBTQ Christians in our churches. We dive so deeply into these conversations that we stop seeing what we have named the other side as people. Those who disagree with us have become objects. They are obstacles to overcome. They are vehicles to get what we want, and they are irrelevancies to ignore. And this isn't limited to nameless strangers we encounter on our, string, on our screens. We do this within our families. We do this to our friends. We do this to neighbors and to members of our church. But we don't do it because any of us are bad people. That's not why. That's not what this is about. We do it because, like the dejected disciples on the road to Emmaus, we're frustrated. We're sad. We're disappointed, and we're lost, and we're lonely, and we're afraid, and we're angry, and we're ashamed, and we're heartbroken, and we are filled with doubt. We might even feel like we have bet our lives on something that has let us down. Our broken hearts, our broken hearts are the ones that go to war. Our broken hearts are the ones that need to meet Jesus today at this table. Just as it changed everything for Cleopas and the other, it can open our eyes to truth. They insist that this stranger stay with them, and so he does. He sits down at their table, the risen Christ, and then the crucified Savior, the risen Jesus, the guest of the disciples, becomes the host. When he took the bread, he blessed it. He broke it, and he gave it to them, and it is then that their eyes were opened wide. Their minds exploded with connections. Their hearts burst open in gratitude and deep relief. They recognized him. They saw him as the risen Lord, and they saw the same one who had fed 5,000 with, with five loaves and a couple of fish. They saw the same one who had shared the final Passover meal with his closest friends. They saw the truth in the testimony of those women at the empty tomb. In the breaking of the bread, a disappointing and confusing day suddenly became Easter. It became Easter in their bones. It became Resurrection Day in their souls. Now they realize that their heated idea debate on the road to Emmaus had been interrupted by the Word made flesh, by the Savior of the world, by the Messiah, by Emmanuel, God with us, by Jesus Christ, risen indeed, the encounter with Jesus Christ over the holy meal turned these grieving hearts at war into bursting hearts at peace. They got up from the table and they charged back to Jerusalem. Only everything about the road was different this time. The road back to Jerusalem was walked with urgency to share the news that the Lord really has risen, not regret about their wasted time on an empty promise. It was walked with joy this time, not despair. It was walked with confidence, not doubt. It was walked with a skip in their step and not dragging feet. It was walked with a story to tell together, not a story to debate again. It was walked in peace, not war. They had approached Emmaus in emotional discussion. They had approached in heated debate, in humiliation over having hitched their wagon to a loser, with anger toward the state, with disappointment in their friends, with a need of someone to blame, with confusion, with hatred, with the desperate need to have been right, and on and on and on. You know many of the things that we are likely to approach this table with today. But at the table, 
their eyes were open. They saw the Lord really is risen. They saw it. They shared something sacred and they found joy in their companion and their hearts were tuned back to peace and as they left the table, their faith was given new life and their relationship was grounded in new depth, forgiveness, hope, grace, and peace. The sacrament that we are about to share today is the grounding ritual of our faith. Repeated practice brings renewed depth to our faith, reminding us of who God is and what God truly has done. It reminds us that we are forgiven again and again and again and again. It fills us with hope, reminding us that Jesus, who defeated death, meets us at this table. It reminds us that God's grace is for us in spite of our nature. It reorients our hearts to peace and hospitality toward others, especially with, the, with those whom we feast and even those with whom we disagree. This table, like the one to Emmaus, moves us from isolation of our need to be right into community with people that our hearts at war might just prefer if they would dine elsewhere. This table changes the tone of our language toward one another. This table eases the anxiety that overwhelms us. This table makes it far more difficult to separate ourselves from those who make us uncomfortable. But we will still try. We'll still try to separate because we're human. Our hearts will go to war. We'll get mad and we'll judge. We'll mock and we'll argue and we will say things that we regret and we will think things that bring us shame. We have and we are, and we will, which is why we have to keep coming back. We have to keep coming back to a table that doesn't really see sides. You will not approach this table today with your side, with your camp, with your tribe, with only those with whom you agree on the, matter, on the matters that matter most to you. You will approach it with children of God, with siblings in Christ, with beautiful and broken people just like you and just like me. You will receive the same sustenance and the same mission to love as someone who makes you crazy. You will receive the same commission to be God's person in the world as someone who you think or maybe even know is flat wrong because that is the invitation before us. That's it. To approach this table again and again and again, we will forget that the Lord really has risen. We will forget that we are loved. We will forget that Christ longs to meet us here. And we will certainly forget that every child of God shares that same invitation. While we encounter the presence of the Lord who really has risen at this table today, we will leave here and before we know it, our hearts will go to war again and we will find ourselves back on the road to Emmaus, which is why John Wesley, the founder of our faith, implored us in his sermon on the duty of constant communion. He said, I am to show you that it is the duty of every Christian to receive the Lord's Supper as often as he or she can. If we have any regard for the plain command of Christ, if we desire the pardon of our sins, if we wish for strength to believe, to love and obey God, then we should neglect no opportunity of receiving the Lord's Supper. Then we must never turn our backs on the feast which our Lord has prepared for us. The Lord who really has risen has prepared the table for you, where the longing of your spirit will be met and you will find your heart at peace. The Lord who really has risen will be host at this table that can transform your walk to Emmaus into a joyful return trip to Jerusalem. The Lord who really has risen will open your eyes to see the people feasting with you are more than the opposing viewpoint that they hold. The Lord really has risen. Come and meet him here. And whatever you do, don't miss a chance to come back. Amen.
Whenever communion is served in a United Methodist Church, the most important thing we can say to you is you are welcome. You do not need to be a member of this church. It doesn't matter your age. It, nothing matters. If you seek to have a bursting heart of peace, then come. The way that we do it in our church is that we offer communion by a method called intinction. It means that you will be offered either a piece of bread or a, a gluten-free wafer that you can dip into the chalice of non-alcoholic grape juice and then receive both symbols together. For those of you who are on the main level, at the direction of our ushers, you'll be invited to come forward to the communion rail to either stand or kneel, whichever is more comfortable for you, so that you can receive uh, the symbols together. If you put your hands out like this, we'll know that you're ready to receive, and if you have your hands together, we know that you want a time of prayer and reflection. For all of you in the balcony, we will offer communion in the balcony. It will be brought to you. In addition to that option, if you wish to come down to the main level, you certainly are welcome to do that. If any of you uh, would request communion coming to you in your seat, simply wave your hand a little later on and one of our ushers will make sure that a server comes to you. With that in mind, I invite you now to take a hymnal and turn to page 12 so that we can begin the process of preparation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward for the presentation of our tithes and offerings. We offer ourselves now, O oh God, with gratitude and enthusiasm, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit on the night in which he gave himself up for us Jesus took bread gave thanks to you broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me when the supper was over he took the cup gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said drink from this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me and so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the same. but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the earth. Amen. The body and the blood of Christ, the body broken for you, the bread of life. The blood of Christ shed for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins the cup of blessing. And now will those who are serving please come forward and please follow the direction of the ushers to come forward as well.
as we come to the conclusion of our worship service, as we always do, we open the doors of our church to you. If today is the day that you would like to become a member of this church, of this faith community, and live out your Christian discipleship here, we would be excited and honored to welcome you. As we sing this hymn, if you would come forward to the communion rail, Dr. Lamar Smith and Reverend Casey Orr will be here to greet you and introduce you to the congregation. So friends, let us now stand and raise our voices to God. Uh, popular members of the Texas Conference was an uncle of this lady's. Jester White was his name. He served Mineola <laughs> when I was uh, too young to mind uh, the, the uh, pastor. But this is Jill O'Leary. She's, she's from the little United Methodist Church in uh, Edgewood, Texas, which is called Cheatham. Memorial United Methodist. Jill, we're delighted to have you come today. Thank you. We welcome you from Very another. Happy to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you. And we'll ask you to stay here and give the folks a chance to welcome you and greet you and meet you and welcome you as a part of our church family. And Jill, as, as you come to join us, we ask if you affirm your faith, reaffirm your faith, and will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and uphold it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Yes, I will. Welcome. Thank you. We do once again invite you to come forward and meet Jill after the service and give her a first church welcome. And in that spirit, our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? We will go out to see God's people in the world. May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.
musical, spiritual moment. You were awesome again. Thank you. Y'all were fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Peggy. That was beautiful.